Peter Old, a world expert on Brugalias, and he's uh, he gained special recognition in 2020 being awarded the Order of Australia Medal for his contribution to the knowledge of Australian plants. Gravelia genus is in a state of flux and he is going to share with us what the challenges are facing this particular genus. So please welcome Peter. So I've been leading this study group for 40 years, but today um, I'm going to not talk about the study group at all. I'm going to talk about the genus Gravelia. One of my passions is uh, taxonomy, the, uh, the study of the classification of the genus at a botanical level. Um, uh, we find that sometimes genera don't even get thought about for hundreds of years. For example, Gravillia was revised in 1993 by Mr. Don McGilray, the late Don McGilray. Uh, and prior to that, it was uh, 1870 since anyone looked at the genus. And from that time, 1870 to 1993, an awful lot happened that didn't get acknowledged or changed or in any way advanced. Uh, since then, there's been a couple of revisions. Uh, Marion and Old, of course, put one out of book a year later, uh, totally disagreeing with the Gilvray revision. And, uh, and that got cost us a lot of blood. And, uh, and then the Makinson revision came out in the floor of Australia in 2000. And I submit that they're all out of date, even now. In 2020, uh, they've changed concepts, changed techniques. Uh, the whole concept about uh, evolution and species uh, has brought great pressure to bear on the way we look at um, our genera and our species. And I submit not only Gravillia, but it will be or a lot of genera and a lot of species groups that are going to change over time. So I thought it would be apt to give you some indication about why that might happen and why the genus is in a state of flux. And it is a, it is a story and a half, really, and I'm not sure if I can get through it in time, but I'll do my damnedest. Okay, so that's Gavillia Wilson and I from Western Australia. One of the most beautiful gravillias. Um, I just put that up to show you the beauty of a gravillia flower. Um, it has nothing to do whatsoever with the talk. <laughs> so, so historically, um, botanical nomenclature, pneumatic um, botany, taxonomy, whatever you call it, was was uh, changed. It always was, but Linnaeus was the one that introduced binomial nomenclature. And, and ordering the genus by the name of a genus and a species. Um, his classification ideas have stood the test of time, although there's been some disagreement uh, with what he's done. But the thing is that Linnaeus had never heard of evolution. And so he believed that species only needed to be identified. And he, he, he started up what they call the artificial system. And the artificial system was, was about the sexual parts of a flower so that they were counted and they were ordered and grouped. And then suddenly you found that you had groups of plants that weren't even remotely related because they had the same number of petals or the same number of ovules or whatever it was that, that grouped them. And his system, the artificial system, was in play uh, for probably about 50 years only even though the binomial part of his uh, idea has stood the test of time and every plant pretty much has got two names. Um, James Edward Smith, who was a British botanist, um, was, uh, purchased his, his whole library, his specimens and everything he owned. He was the most senior British botanist at the time and uh, he formed the Linnaean Society in England. So Linnaeus has quite a, a big history. Um, shortly after about 18, uh, 1789, Antoine Laurent de Ducier, who was a French botanist whose father, Bernard, had some pretty good ideas but passed away before they got published. And his idea was to group plants according to their natural affinities. And to some extent, that's exactly what we want today. Um, what, what his idea was that are all the plants that 
uh, were pleased to get that were all, say, grevilleas, you know, but not grevilleas and corias and other different things. It's called the natural system. So plants that were naturally great related um, um, were grouped together. So our friend uh, Robert Brown, Robert Brown, of course, was the most important botanist that ever graced our shores as a foreign botanist. He's the man on the left. He, he was the one that changed things because he took uh, Jussieu's ideas to a new level and uh, began to follow him and to introduce his whole taxonomy. Now the Australian flora effectively is based on Brown's initial ideas. You know, he's the, he's the godfather, if you like, of Australian botany. But to me, uh, another man a little bit later was Carl Meissner. He's the man there on your right. He uh, wrote the Proteaceae in uh, Dick Handel's um, work on price. And he, um, he uh, uh, described a really quite a large number of species and he was still um, what we might call a natural grouper. He, did not, um, he didn't actually know anything about evolution uh, at that time. Uh, it was about just grouping things together and getting them uh, nice and ordered. So Meissner, he was a terrific botanist. So I personally think he was better than Brown, but you know, that's a matter for debate. Um, I think he was a very thorough, very Swiss professor, a, a very, very ordered man and uh, put things down here and he published for about 10 years, but he, he achieved a great deal. Not a lot of people know much about him. Actually, I was in Switzerland, Geneva Botanic Garden some time ago and I asked what they had on him and they said, who? <laughs> so there you go, that's, they didn't even know their own botanist, you know. So the thing that changes everything was the publication in 1859 on the origin of species. Charles Darwin. Charles Darwin uh, made a tremendous difference to what we do today. But it has to be said that it took nearly 100 years or more before Australian botany realised that they could do anything with the idea of evolution. So things didn't change very much. So for example, George Bentham still believed, even though 1870 was uh, 11 years after the publication, they already knew what Darwin was on about. They nonetheless still thought that species were fixed because Darwin challenged the very idea of God. Everybody thought if you had evolution, that's God's out of the picture. So it was a heresy almost to believe in, in uh, even Darwin himself was a bit... A bit Called in the crossfire of it. Of course, he was a, a Christian, but he still reconciled evolution to it. I think he had a lot of trouble with it. And of course, the idea that there was uh, that God intervened in all this, you know, it it uh, it flew out the window with Darwin's Darwin series. And so um, it took the world an awful long time. It took into Australia. Australia. Australia did not adopt the idea of evolution in botany until about 1950. So that's 100 years. It took them a while to get used to it. One of the things about Darwin is that I always thought was interesting. Um, Darwin, uh, Darwin didn't address the subject of the evolution of man. It was only the evolution of animals and plants. Of course, we're animals, but you know, we are just special animals. So, um, he, he just, Darwin, Darwin described evolution, and uh, we'll just lose my place here, um, as a continuous gradual change over time. But species are distinct from each other suggesting that some process has created a discontinuity or a gap between them. And this is a problem that only dawned on people after a time. You know, they didn't realise that if, if everything changes gradually, so why are all these gaps? So why are there species? And uh, these uh, conundra were, were um, addressed by doing the most to understand this was dark light with a, a man called Ernst... Uh, well, Bantham and Ferdinand Muir, of course, they were responsible for the Australian 
um, social vision in the Australian flora, but they believed in the fixity of species. So we still, 11 years later, hadn't quite got to. Certainly Mueller did not at all accept uh, Darwinist ideas. It was 1942 in America that a man called Ernst Mayer, M-A-Y-R, a German-born man, who uh, is given the credit for trying to resolve what it meant to have as a species uh, in the Darwinian context. But he didn't really address the, the idea of the fact that they had a genealogy. He really just addressed the idea of how do you recognise them? And he introduced the idea of reproductive isolation, that species were uh, reproductively isolated from each other and that's how we could recognise them. But the only problem with that was it, that could only be proved if they were growing together. And then you've got the problem later that most species don't grow together. So that species might over there be growing with something else. And so what happened was that all the species uh, that lived in other populations, it was just speculated on the fact that um, that they also would be reproductively isolated if they were growing with this species. It was a fairly convo con uh, convoluted uh, um, theory, but in bird or ornithological taxonomy and plant taxonomy, the uh, botanists in Australia and America really piled on. They embraced this theory with great um, alacrity, I would say, and also with with great enthusiasm. Everybody, even Dr. Laurie Johnson, was a believer in this method of testing species. But the problem, problem was that you never knew where the species ended. You know, you could go and say that population, they're a little bit different from this one, but, but no, they're the same. So that, we'll put that in. And then even further afield, you get other species, and you go, oh, gee, that's a fair bit different. We'll make that a variety. And then so it went on. And then we make that a subspecies. And so the fundamental unit of, uh, of uh, species delimitation was the subspecies, the smallest, the lowest, whereas it should have been the species unit that was the most important. And, and gradually, uh, the theory began to fall out of place. There was a little bit of questioning. And one of the men that did the most to do that was um, Joel Craycraft. Who you've probably never heard of Joel Craycraft, but he wrote a lot of papers, a series of papers that questioned Mayer's um, philosophy. Mayer's philosophy was called the biological species concept. And Joel uh, Craycraft introduced the word that you've heard today a few times, the phylogenetic species concept. Now, what that means is that species have a lineage because of evolutionary theory. We now know that species evolve from a point and it's that point and all its ancestors that create a lineage and that is the phylogenetic species concept that we now by and large in botany come to follow. And the point of that is that if you're going to test a species as broad as a biological species what are you going to test? Which part of that plant is, a, is the species? And I, I raised the question of the herbarium one day. I said, what's the difference between a subspecies and a closely related species? And they couldn't answer me. They, huh? Oh, well, 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 it's because it's a bit of overlap. Well, what's sort of overlap? What's the difference philosophically between a species and a uh, a closely related species and a subspecies. And so um, that, that, uh, that spark, I suppose you might say in me, um, enlivened debate about just what are the limits of what a species is. And the phylogenetic species is that it is an ir irreducible unit of morphology. That is, you can't go any further down by, by dividing off, saying the plants with these sort of leaves and the plants with those sort of leaves, the minimal description becomes the evolutionary unit. It's the evolutionary unit that's important because we can test the evolutionary unit and we can put it on a phylogenetic tree. And as you know, 
uh, in the world of genetics, they're trying to take over botany and they're succeeding to some extent, but um, uh, I'm still holding out. This is Austin Mast. Austin Mast is the devil that everyone hates. Everybody hates Austin, don't they, Phil? Yeah, Phil, Austin, Austin Mars is a brilliant scientist and he's a, a phylogeneticist and he, he doesn't know plants at all. All he does is test the genes and uh, puts out the trees and then uh, makes his proclamations. So he did a lot of work in Banks here and uh, Dry Andrew and now he's done a lot of work with others uh, in Hachia and Grevillea. Now, some of you might or might not know about the argument that Hachia and Grevillea are very closely related. In fact, a lot of people have questioned the fact, are they the same? Are they the same genus? I want to show you this. I know you can't read that. I know you can't read that. You can't read that. But I wonder if you can see these lines. Yes. Right. That's called a chronogram. And that there is the age up to 65 million years over here of the arriving of those plants into the environment. So here we have, this is the group of plants that we're looking at, the Hakini. A Pisciolepus comes right over here at 55 million years ago. I mean, that's just fantastic that they can do that. How do they do that? Because, well, it hasn't got it on it. But they, they get pollen or fossils that are dated to a certain point in time and they plot the date on the, on the chart and then the chart relates back to that chronology so they can estimate the age of the plants that are extant today. Oh, that is just fabulous. So here we've got another line up here which goes all the way back into Buckinghamia. Two species of Buckinghamia still existing and this is the one I'm interested in here today, is Bavilia and Licoriana, which came into the environment 38 million years ago. Well, who would have thought that that is basal lineage in Bavilia? Nobody ever, ever thought that. So I'm going to hurry along. So can you see that? What's the problem with their tree? Problem with their tree is you can see the Buckinghamia come in and it bifurcates. They call it bifurcating. One thing goes that way, another thing goes that way. So N. Licoriana comes in, goes that way, all the rest come down, and the next group can be resolved by formers. They come down, bifurcating tree. Oh, oh no. Here we've got four. Four things that come off at the same time. And what that means is it's unresolved. It's an unresolved tree because we don't know what happened during that period of time. But what did the tree did come up with with all these things down here on one of those lines was Hagia, Finchia, a couple of Grevilleas, as you can see, with different groups. And then another group came up with Grevillea baleana, that's the, a single species. And then uh, another group up there by uh, Grevillea sensu stricto and Grevillea buxifolia group. Sorry, I, I know that it's going over your head, but I'm trying to, to explain to you <laughs> that the tree is unresolved, but it's got those two genera and Haiti have been nested right down there. Um, there's a suggestion that they actually are all Haitians. Now, <laughs> how many minutes now? This is Grevillea red licoriana in the wild. That's it in cultivation. Who ever thought that that was primal? This is Grevillea baleana, a rainforest species where we thought the genus originated. These are the flowers. It's the only genus that, the only species that came out on its own. Regular flowers, what did it achieve? Right, one thing that it found well, that Scrovillia was divided into eight clades or eight groups. And then two, Endicriana and Baleana, were a single species. And therefore, as we see, Hachia and Finchia deeply nested in Grevillea implies that they all belong in the same genus. And therefore, there was a, because Hachia has priority, that Hachia would get the name. And so 
there was a lot of consideration about there a lot of things like you know how do we get to that tree well we've only tested five genes there's thousands of genes in a plant surely there's possibly a bit of doubt there because how do you know which genes to test what are the most informative genes we don't know that so there was a bit, bit of argument and then um, and then we go well maybe we'll change the the uh we'll make Grevillea have the age that you know we'll change the rules and Grevillea will have uh, the age instead of Hakea and so we'll make them all Grevillea and make the Hakeas all Grevilleas can you imagine the majority of Grevilleas uh, evolved 15 million years ago uh, with a ridification I just wanted to show you these quick ones this is Grevillea um, Burundong it's species only name from cult cultivation of Burundong which I've identified a recent one Grevillea Burrowa a publication hasn't been affected yet, but it's due this year. It's Gavilia Gillingara, Western Australian. This one's just been described. This is uh, Gavilia Gilmorei, correct, six plants in the Jewa National Park. That's Macleana, which we took it out of. And this is a new species, uh, Gavilia milleriana, known from one plant. I took a bit of, they took a bit of uh, explaining that one. That's it there grows in Madden's Plains, just south of Sydney. But we do have uh, information that there are more plants than we haven't found them yet. New species discovered in West Australia this year, which I've collected. Here it is. Hasn't been described yet. And I wanted to show you this is the future. This is Convilia vestita, well-known plant, well-known plant. But this is the pink form, and it's a stunner. All right, I'll leave it there. If you enjoyed this presentation, then please subscribe to our channel. Other presentations from the conference are available in this playlist, with new ones being added all the time.